us around us when we all build upon each other. Well, first up is going to be um, Henrico County. Henrico County uh, is represented today by John Petokas. Did I say that right, sir? Thank you very kindly. And Audrey, did I say that correctly? Audrey <coughs> Parrish. She's a 2000, and excuse me, John, he's the county manager from Henrico County. And it's a wonderful one, too. It's our next door neighbor out from Goosman County. Also, Audrey was the um, 2015 intern. Uh, they will be discussing for us the internship program for Henrico County. The title is Developing the Workforce for Tomorrow. There's a lot of takeaways for you here, so please let's welcome John and Audrey. Good afternoon, everyone. And as I begin, the uh, internship program that, that Audrey is going to cover with you uh, this afternoon, and I do want her to cover the uh, program, is not one that was specific to, even though it says county managers uh, internship uh, program. This is a, uh, an effort that, and let me back up. I have been uh, fortunate enough to be the county manager for Henrico County uh, for three years. January will mark the beginning of my fourth year as, uh, as manager. And when I was uh, Audrey's age, I was given the opportunity to intern with a city manager, at the time a city manager from the city of Richmond. And like Audrey, I, uh, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And ultimately, when I saw that city manager in action, saw some of the things that uh, occurred at City Hall, that changed me forever. And early in my career, I was given the opportunity, as I was finishing graduate school, to uh, work with someone who made me promise that I would do whatever I could in my capacity to pay it forward for young people. And so for Henrico County, we have initiated an internship program, and this may sound a little hokey, um, where we are now hiring high school students, we're hiring college students, we are hiring uh, graduate students and PhD candidates. The high school students typically uh, are not paid. The college students, if we can somehow bring them in for credit, we will bring them in. High school students, typically, the only rule is uh, we want you to be a, um, uh, we want you to go to a Henrico uh, high school. I will tell you that when we first started this, I inquired with our schools, tried to get them on board to also offer internships for high school students, and the response that I initially got was not positive. Uh, and now our school system is offering these interns for high school students past two years, we've had 144 interns in Henrico County. Um, just some examples, building inspections, we had one in the field. Uh, county Attorney's Office, we had four um, on-the-job training. Audrey's one of five that have run through uh, my office. Fire, 15. Police, 26. Rec and Parks, we've had 16 largely in the field. Utilities, 16 largely in the field. We've had eight of these millennials, or what did you call them? Linksters. Linksters. <laughs> they come in and they know whether or not our website is uh, is going to attract the traffic or what we should be looking at um, doing uh, better. Uh, the one thing I would encourage you, if you are looking to do this, you've got to take a chance and make the work real. Because this young lady did real work, and I don't think... Um, I, I, I know she's the only intern at this conference, so I'm going to step back and let her uh, talk about the, uh, the internship program that we have at Henrico County. But I can tell you that as a father of three, when I see some of these young folks coming through and I hear some of the difficulty that our nation is facing, the reality is whether they're linksters or millennials, they get it. And we have to give them the tools early on to be able to do uh, what it is that they need to do to fix the mess that you know, generate that we all collectively will have left them at the time. So, Audrey, if you would come forward. Thank you, Mr. Baker. 
So my name is Audrey Parrish. I'm a junior right now at Virginia Tech studying political science and Spanish um, and minoring in sociology. I plan to go to law school, but this past summer has really given me some insight into some other options for my future. So I just want to give you guys a little look into my experience this past summer and why I think Henrico won best in category. So um, applying for this internship, I had a few expectations, but I didn't really know what I was going to be getting into. Um, as a political science major, I learned a lot about governments internationally and how they interact with the federal government, how it interacts with state governments, healthcare, all those things that happen nationwide, statewide, but I don't really ever learn about local government, so I was very excited to get to know more of the nitty gritty, um, as well as experience effective management, um, since I'd be applying to the county manager's office. Um, also, if you guys don't know, Virginia Tech is a research institute. So they try to pump research into every single class I've ever taken. Um, every major has a required research methods class to help us um, hone and become interested in personal research. Um, so I'm very excited. I thought maybe you know this would really help me broaden my research skills, as well as become a better public servant and citizen. Which I will say, I absentee voted this past week for Henrico County. <laughs> In contrast to my expectations, I had some personal goals once I was offered the job. Um, so I wanted to know everything about Henrico County. I mean, I've always known that counties are kind of what affects us the most out of government, but I didn't really know the house. Um, also to learn from experienced department leaders. I was super stoked to be in the uh, manager's office, but I wanted to know more about the individual departments that make up the county, as well as gain <coughs> more world experience, and in this day and age, networking is so important, so I was really excited about that. And like I said, find other passions to pursue, maybe, other than law. So here's a little bit about myself. Um, that's Crystal and Carrie. They're in the uh, manager's office. They're just management specialists. Um, and that's us at the community day that we hosted. But just some obstacles. My one main obstacle is professionalism. Um, I've had a lot of jobs already. I've worked since I was 15. but. Um, it's something that isn't really taught in school or how to act when you're in a professional world when you're wearing a pantsuit. So I wanted to learn more about that and how to overcome that. My skills are I'm very analytical and research oriented. Um, personally, I think my personality is my best trait. So I, that's one of my skills. But also research, computers, um, kind of just anything you could think of I'm really interested in. So like I said, my interests are law, government, um, since I'm a Spanish major, I love Spanish. I um, hope to study abroad in Spain. But I also value loyalty, honesty, and empathy. This will come in later in my presentation. So here are some of the projects that I worked on in a broader <coughs> spectrum. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, I wrote comments for the manager. Didn't know how to do that. Now I think I can write you comments for anything. <laughs> um, but like he said, I really worked on real projects, and that made me feel worthwhile. Um, I looked into a lot of future investments for the county and got to really research, interview people, figure out, you know, would this be worth it for the county for the future. Um, and some of my projects even took <coughs> flight while I was there. So that was really awesome to see because I'd come home and be like, Mom, I matter, <laughs> you know? Um, as well as research how, you know, organizations and businesses currently in Henrico County really help to even benefit the county. Like, is it worth it, cost analysis, all that stuff. Um, I also suggested improvements from my millennial perspective. Uh, for example, in, Henrico offers their student government day, which I was a part of when I went to Deep Run High School in Henrico. So I really kind of came in and I worked with Crystal and Carrie, ladies from the previous slide, to really suggest how you could improve it and kind of make it matter more to a high school oriented um, audience. Finally, I got to work with department leaders and the boards uh, and super, board of supervisors with their board and commissions, and I actually felt very, very important and kind of like a family in Henrico. In addition to that, I got to tour almost everything you could ever think of that's in a county, so now I know pretty much every service that's offered to its citizens. Um, I got to go to community events like town halls. I got to go to board of supervisors meetings. Every other week, I was in pre-board. Um, I'm also, since I'm interested in law, it was really awesome because they let me shadow the Commonwealth attorney and the county attorney all summer long, uh, which is not something that many people uh, have done at my age. So all these opportunities really just kind of helped to show me more about what local government does, which is what I said I was interested in. 
So, for example, um, during the recession, my father lost his job, and it was just a really big struggle because he didn't attend college. So it's really hard now without a college degree to get a job, all that stuff. If my family had known about the Workforce Center in Henrico County, that could have really helped him. The resources offered through that are amazing. So just something like that, or just social services, mental health. I didn't even know that anyone in Henrico could just go to the mental health facility and get some much-needed help. Um, in addition, the professionalism that I said, I actually feel like I know how to operate and hold myself now, even though I'm a little nervous for this. I feel very prepared, and I feel very professional, and I don't feel so awkward um, when I'm in a professional setting. Uh, like I said, I really feel like I'm part of the family now. Um, like when I called today just to talk to Crystal, I talked to Roz, who is the um, receptionist for the county manager's office, and I can't tell you how much I met Roz. So I actually feel like a part of the family. When I walked into work every day, you know, everyone cared about each other. It wasn't just, I don't know, from my perspective, the professional world kind of seems a little scary, and it didn't feel that way at all. Um, and something that's really important that the manager always speaks about is the Henrico way. Um, going into this, I kind of, my perspective is mottos are mottos. I think everyone's got one, doesn't really matter. But I can tell you the Henrico way is, is shown every, every day in all the employees. Um, and it's just crazy to me how much the employees care about the citizens. And being able to have this opportunity through an internship to see that has really changed my perspective. I mean, last year and the year before, I didn't care to vote <laughs> absentee for Henrico. Now there was not a chance I was going to miss that. I actually feel involved, and I actually understand the importance of every single department and how it really helps make the uh, local government and the county operate. So here's a picture of all the interns <coughs> from this summer. Um, but Henrico really helped me overcome my obstacles, sharpen my skills. Um, I thought I knew a lot about uh, Microsoft Excel. Now I can really master that. <laughs> So it also sparked my interest. Like I said, I am actually very interested now in public administration um, a lot as well as law, but we'll see what happens. And finally, it helped me display my values by finding friends in the workforce, um, seeing the honesty that's given every day by the employees, and just the empathy that's given all around by Henrico. So thank you very much for letting me present today. <laughs> well, first of all, women, Audrey, please, you have one question yes. for you, because here again, this is a learning experience for all of the other counties also. Because you were an intern, and because Hen Michael has this internship program, and some of the other counties may not, what would be the word that you would say to those counties as going forward for them? I think you need it. It's not really a if or when, I think you need to think about it now. Um, if you want the people to, who are going to replace you to care about the counties that, as what you care, then you need to teach them now. Um, yeah, going through you know all the schools in Henrico, I've known you know all the history about Henrico, all that stuff. I know that my school bus says Henrico County on it. Um, but until this internship, I didn't really know much about local government. And now I'm super excited, and I tell all my friends in my major that they really need to get involved with their local government and actually care about the localities and if I didn't have this internship then I wouldn't know that so I don't think it's an if or a when I think it's a now kind of thing I think it's really necessary yeah I would like to have a copy of the page that was in the projects oh we got to take a picture and I'm, I'm pretty savvy with this but it wouldn't <laughs> yes ma'am can I get a copy of your presentation yes we will have it uh, on our website okay. but at the end of the, the um, session you can take a photo okay. we'll pull it up <laughs> yeah but we'll, they'll all be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say here, thank you, John and Audrey, for a wonderful program. This was one of their four uh, categories they've won in, and this was um, uh, one of the best finalists uh, as far as uh, the Achievement Awards program. So thank you again, and please give our well. Uh, <laughs> Next up is Charles Cully, right? Yeah. Charles Cully is a um, uh, uh, Caroline County Administrator. They have their program on um, recovery community program. He's going to talk to us about that. Now, um, one of the things I can say about this is that um, he has, this is your fourth time winning an award for, for VACO. This is your first since 2007, am I correct? Oh, great. Well, so welcome back. 
and take it forward, please, Charles. Well, thanks for letting me follow up. <laughs> Millennial or whatever. Yeah, an old guy. Um, uh, our firm, I'll tell you this right off the top, I'm not taking credit for it. I didn't have anything to do with it. It was started before I got here. But I put the PowerPoint together and we won we won the award with, with help of staff. On your watch. The problem, like many localities throughout the nation, Caroline County, Virginia, has been forced to commit increasingly scarce physical resources to incarcerating adult prisoners, many of whom are repeat offenders. Research conducted by the United States Department of Justice indicates that two-thirds of drug offenders will be rearrested within three years of release. Almost half will go back to prison because of a technical violation of their sentence or a new conviction. And you probably can't see these charts, and this will be on the internet for you to look at, but you can see number of deaths from heroin as you work out from 2001 to 2013. You can see that blue bar and you can see those lines uh, of how bad a problem just heroin is. Thus, jail and drug offenders often becomes a revolving door that is costly to local governments. An innovative method of reducing the number of offenders was needed. Approximately six years ago, the Caroline County Board of Supervisors prevailed upon the office of the Commonwealth Attorney to explore methods of controlling the increasing cost of incarcerating offenders without a corresponding negative impact on public safety. Another little chart shows you uh, drug dependence and marijuana is that top blue line. You can go down into other drugs and you can see they're not as bad. This program began in February of 2011. I came to Carolina in 2012, so that's why I'm not taking <laughs> credit for that. Designed to divert some criminal defendants into a long-term recovery program who would otherwise be sent to jail or prison. If the offender has never been in trouble with law before, he or she may be sentenced to the program by a judge. If the <coughs> individual successfully completes the program, the judge often drops the pending charges after a year. Participating in uh, the Caroline uh, County Recovery Community Program may also be a condition of release of the bond against the offender. Pending successful completion of the program, a plea agreement is often worked out with no jail time served. <coughs> Other inmates may voluntarily decide to participate in the program based on word of mouth of the success. A few stats I pulled out off of the internet just to kind of give you a history a little bit of the problem. In 1971, we sort of declared a war on drugs. So we've been fighting this problem a long time. Percentage of incarcerated men and women who are alcohol or drug dependent, men 52%, women 44%. Inmates with, who re, uh, received treatment, in 97 it was 1 in 3, today it's 1 in 7. So we're not doing a better job of treating, we're doing really a less job. Dependent inmates who receive drug treatment is less than 20%. The number of incarcerated in 1972, 300,000. The number incarcerated in 2011, 2,300,000. So we've sort of tripled drug arrests over the last 25 years. For a dollar spent on addiction treatment, uh, the cost of drug-related crimes is reduced be between four and seven dollars. Reduced criminal activity, treatment, reduced arrest and activity, 80 percent, 64 percent of arrests reduced. Compared to incarceration, treatment has been shown to reduce drug-related crime by about 15 times. As jail and prison sentences extend, the likelihood of reoffense rises. Study of rearrest rates by level of treatment. Drug users who didn't enter treatment, 52% are rearrested. This nationwide study. Drug users who entered but did not complete, 43. Drug users who completed treatment, 22%. So you can see there's a correlation to trying to fix the problem. Treatment and aftercare. Drug offenders who receive full treatment and aftercare have reduced drug use by 50 to 70%. Between 2004 and 2006, 13 states started looking at these programs more heavily to see if they could reduce the, 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 the problem of our citizen. Public-private partnership. Caroline County Community Program, Recovery Program is a truly unique and wonderful example of public-private partnership where everyone benefits. A private organization in the county have come together to implement solutions to a very difficult problem that plagues every community and trains valuable tax dollars desperately needed for core government functions. The program could not achieve success without each partner supporting each other. McShin could not pursue its mission of changing lives without the approval of the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Likewise, the Commonwealth Attorney's Office could not reduce drug and alcohol-related recidivism without a partner to provide successful recovery services. 
Ultimately, the program cannot be sustained in the long run without the support and financial backing of the Board of Supervisors. Commonwealth Attorney Anthony Tony Spencer responded to the challenge posed by the Board with, by partnering with McShen Foundation of Richmond to create this recovery program. McShen is a national lead on delivering recovery support <coughs> services. While the average success rate for substance abuse services is 7% nationally, McShen has a success rate approaching 50%. In addition to providing recovery support programs to inmates, McShin established a resource recovery center in Henrico that offers support to offenders released from jail. The center is open seven days a week, hosts AA and NA meetings every day and night. At the center, McShin offers peer relapse prevention groups, recovery coaches, and job placement <coughs> services. The center can also provide peer and faith-based contacts, linkage to other agencies and services, and housing referrals. McShin's recovery resource center in Henrico is too far away to serve Caroline's residents effectively. <clears throat> Many drug offenders living in remote parts of Caroline find themselves unable to reach critically needed services, particularly when their driving privileges have been suspended and there's very limited public transportation options. For example, imagine a recovering addict who's on parole and living without a driver's license in a remote part of the county. He would have spent time in prison. He would never have had the opportunity to participate in a drug court program. He would be 15 miles from nearest public transportation, a bus line to localities north of Caroline. Somehow we'd have to travel 40 miles to Ashland to see his probation officer, 20 miles to see his substance abuse counselor, almost 50 miles to attend any court-ordered programs like anger management or batterers intervention. He would be about 30 miles away from the county's one NA meeting a week and have to travel hundreds of miles a week to other localities if he wanted to attend 90 meetings in 90 days. All of this without a driver's license while he's supposed to be finding a job. The chance of success under these circumstances is virtually zero. The McShen Foundation believes strongly in peer-to-peer -peer recovery support and would utilize recovering addicts and alcoholics to educate, mentor, and spread the message of recovery to individuals new to sobriety. A peer-based model is utilized so that someone who has lived the experience of incarceration and recovery is in charge of administering the program. The ex-addict is much more credible and able to instill a sense of hope and motivation. After all, they are a living testimony that recovery is possible. Participants can avoid incarceration if they successfully participate in the program for 12 months. They must abide by a strict contract and are subject to random drug tests. If they test positive for drugs, they are placed in jail for a week and must begin the 12-month program all over again. The CCRCP is a day reporting program that requires participants to not only report to the center daily, which is in Bowling Green, but also participate in multiple meetings throughout the week, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, as well as educational programming focusing on life skills, job preparation, and etc. Each participant must have a sponsor and is also provided with a recovery coach mentor from the McShin Foundation. Although the CCRCP does not have a residential component, rules must be followed when not in the center, such as a daily curfew. The program has four phases, lasting 90 days. In order to complete and graduate from the program, the individual must have a full year of sobriety. Results of the program, the exciting part, offenders sentenced to serve a time by Carolina courts are housed at Pumont Regional Jail in Hanover, cost approximately $47.50 a day in Hanover with, 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 with these. Uh, as our partner, the offender receives a sentence of less than two years or he or she will typically spend the entire sentence at Pumont. If the sentence is more than two years, the offender will typically go to the state system. Spending to incarcerate individuals has mounted quickly for Carolina, uh, for a very rural small county. 2012, a million seven. 2013, two million. 2014, reduced a little bit, still one million nine out of a 42 million dollar uh, county budget. So uh, expensive to house. According to the March 2014 study by Sarah Scarborough, PhD, of the 44 individuals who graduated from the Carolina Recovery uh, Program in the past two years, two and a half years, only two have returned to jail. That was in March of 14. This reflects a success rate of over 95%, meaning that 95% of the individuals who participated didn't go back to jail. <coughs> this 4.5% recidivism rate is extremely low, 25% lower than the state uh, by a prison average at a bare minimum. Translates into tremendous monetary savings for Carolina County and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Based on the study by Dr. Scarborough, the county experienced just $221,053 of direct savings just from the 21 participants in the program at the time the study was conducted. By participating in the program, these offenders avoided approximately 4,653 total days in jail at a cost of $47.50 a day per person. 
factoring all the individuals who have graduated since the inception of the program in 2011, the study estimates Caroline County has saved nearly a million dollars in jail costs. In addition, it's estimated that two of these 21 participants in the program at the time of the study would have received two years or more, one likely four and a half years, in state prison, which would have saved uh, the state of uh, Virginia about $112,500 on those two individuals, because uh, it's about $25,000 a year to incarcerate in uh, state prison. Not reflected in the aborted uh, jail per diems are savings and additional revenues from having the permanent conditions work, pay taxes, support children who might otherwise receive public assistance. Perhaps the most important achievement is the long-term societal benefits of reducing recidivism and promoting healthier families. Since its inception, uh, the CCRCP has had a tremendous success in keeping drug offenders out of prison and breaking the cycle of dependency. This in turn has saved Carolina County and the Commonwealth hundreds of thousands of dollars in direct jail costs. Incarceration fails to address the core problem and therefore amounts to an expensive and unprecedented <coughs> revolving door of relapse and recidivism. Rather than trying to arrest away the problem, the CCRCP gives drug offenders an opportunity to put their lives back together, avoid jail time, become productive members of a society. It's not an exaggeration to say that the program truly saves lives. The benefits to Carolina County enormous and extend well beyond significant dollars saved from sending fewer inmates to Vermonti Regional Jail. Those who successfully complete the program are able to go from being a burden on society to a productive member of society. They're able to work, pay taxes, and potentially keep their children off public assistance. The benefits cannot be overstated. Perhaps the most important is the example they set for their children, thereby lessening the chance the cycle will repeat itself in future generations. A little bit about the investment. The annual budget for the Carolina County Recovery uh, Community Program is approximately 63000 The budget funds the facility in the county to house uh, the CCRCB, the staff, the drug testing, supplies, event planning, graduation, and other related costs. A nice picture of uh, my board chairman uh, when we received the vacant award there. Uh, on average, 25 individuals, individuals who graduate from the program each year. This translates into about $2,520 cost to serve one person per year. From its beginning, it was funded by the McShin Foundation. In 2015, the Carolina Board of Supervisors became convinced of the positive results of the program um, after uh, Dr. Scarborough's uh, report and, and, and hearing testimony from uh, successful uh, folks in the program. And we now contribute 30000 annually uh, to the line in our budget to the program. This support has uh, become an ongoing commitment. Model for other localities, why y'all may be interested, many other localities throughout the Commonwealth face similar spiraling costs for incarcerating drug offenders and similar challenges in providing services to reduce recidivism. The Caroline County Recovery Community Programs offers a template for an innovative path to achieving success and coming to grips with this very complex societal problem. Collaboration between the Commonwealth's attorney and treatment partners such as McShin and the Board of Supervisors, combined with the willingness to step out of the traditional comfort zone and to try a new approach, can lead to positive results. A little bit about McShin, and I'm almost finished Founded in 2004, McShin Foundation is Virginia's leading nonprofit, full-service recovery community organization, committing to serving individuals and families in their fight against substance abuse disorders, while providing the tools for recovery, individ recovering individuals to create positive lifestyles. They aim to spread the word of recovery, educate families, communities, and government regarding substance abuse disorders, as well as reduce the stigma attached to them. The McShin Foundation is a great alternative for drug and alcohol treatment drug and alcohol rehab and drug and alcohol detox. They continue to have the most affordable detox recovery in several living residents in the county and are the nation's leading recovery community center. I'd like to thank Mr. Allen Parton, assistant county administrator. He was the one that actually submitted to NACO and VACO uh, this program. So with that, I would gladly try to answer any questions that I went along a little fast because I knew I was right on my time limit. I got a question. You said that uh, if the person had lost his job, lost his driver's license, he had to come to uh, Bowling Green every Bowling Green. day? He would have to report in, but he has a sponsor, so there are people that help him get there. It's just a lot easier. Uh, Carolina's sort of a big square of 540 <coughs> square miles, and, and Bowling Green is sort of it really is central. So it's easier for him to get there than, say, to get to Ashland or to Fredericksburg or in Rico, where McShin actually operates their building. So while it is a burden, it's... Over there. 
it's the best burden you could have. But yeah, they do have to report in. There's a right in Bowling Green, uh, right near the courthouse. They they uh, rent a building, and that's where the recovery center is, and, and their support is, and they run their AA program and their NA program, and 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 the folks running the manager is a is a, re a recovered person that you know for a number of years, so he can speak to those folks about you know this is a way forward. So if, if a McShin or someone like McShin weren't involved, would the county still fund this? Right now the county has $63,000 going in. into we have, 30. we have 30. McShin 30. has 63 okay. going in every year. So what, what would you do if McShin went away? Would, would the county fund it? Just if, between us. I know McShin's not here. Yeah. No, I, we, we would like to see the program continue. You, you really need a partner, especially in a rural community. We don't have anybody to, to manage the, the – the, so we'd have to have a recovery – partner, a nonprofit, a 501c that 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 uh, deals with these folks that I think we would continue to fund if they were successful. I'm not going to say that if somebody rolled in tomorrow we would we would still give them thirty thousand without a proven record. So McShin actually said it came to the board in two thousand eleven and said we can run a program and the board said prove it it's going to be successful. Didn't give them any money. They came back with this study from a, a, a VCU professor uh, uh, at, that had studied the program and said these are the benefits, and they brought in about 15 or 20 different folks across socioeconomic, race, everything, to the board of supervisors, and they listened to their stories for about 25 minutes. Of hey, this program turned my life around. I'm sick. I am. I'm working. I'm successful. And they were hooked on all kinds of different problems uh, with with drugs, and uh, young and middle aged. So it's it's it, they, they serve. All sorts of folks, and so I think my board, my chairman's here, um, would certainly support the continued operation of this program if Machine were to pull out. But I don't, I don't think they're going any, going anywhere. If I could just add, and I know the time is limited, but we can't tell you enough about this program, and that's one reason I came because. You know, a lot of times when you hear programs, when you go and you see demonstrations, you think that it's just something that's being said. I can assure you, as chairman of the board of Carlisle County, this is a program that really worked. We were very impressed. Uh, and even though our county administrator says it, it wasn't for him, uh, his doing, it was his doing. Because all of us know that the county administrator is the one who finds the funds for these programs. And he was able to help us to do that. So, so he does deserve a, a great deal of credit for this. Uh, and I think the last thing I will say is, Carolina County is a rural community. And people know each other. And a lot of people witness people that they know had problems, and they actually saw those problems dealt with in a positive manner. And I think that was the best source of, of, uh, of getting the word out that I could think of. Uh, I, I worked in the school system for 33 years as a teacher and an administrator. And some of those people who came through there, I, I remember them as young people in the school system who had some issues. And then I could see them, those issues being dealt with in a positive fashion and they returning to the community as a positive part of the problem as opposed to being re-incarcerated. So, Having said that, it, it, it's a great program. Excellent. Yes, sir. Is McShin looking to uh, grow and expand and, and move out into other counties if we're willing to? I think them? if you're willing to have a conversation with them, they would be willing to talk to you, I would think. Yes, sir. Um, I'm from Clark County, close to Frederick County, and we have a terrible drug problem. We've had many, many overdoses, and we have a drug enforcement task force, and we're trying to figure out how to work from just arresting to treating, which is not good, but um, we have, you know, child removal, big thing in foster care, trying to find families that will take these children from drug affected families. And I have heard the McFins, um, Shims, they came to a family night we had with people that had lost loved ones to drugs, but they're in Richmond. We're in you know, up in the top part of Shenandoah Valley. How would you, because we, we're ready to move on something. We have people that are interested in finding an answer. What kind of advice would you get, give us? I mean, you just asked about McShin fanning out. 
I mean, is this something we can think about? Or, I mean, I would like to think they would be they would entertain working in your community because they have the ability, even though they're in Richmond, I would think to be able to start. You know, you got to get a building. You got to rent a building. You got to have a building. The county got to. You got to have a place for them to start. They can find people in recovery that are willing to give back because. I've never suffered with that, so I can't speak to that. But I, the people you meet in that, a lot of them want to give back because they found their way out of the hole that they were in, and they want to give back to help other people. So there are people that are willing to work for them and, and be the counselors and the managers of the program. So I think there's people in your community that they could end up hiring. So they don't have to bring people from Richmond. They just have to have that overall corporate structure to be able to set a satellite office. Bowling Green's not... I mean, it's closer than you are, but Bowling Green's not sort of close to Richmond, so the, it's, the people are local that they have in Bowling Green. Well, what about drug court? I mean, does this help or not help, or you, what? You have to have a, the willingness of the Commonwealth Attorney and the judges yeah. to look at folks and say, we're going to put you in, you know, we're, we're willing to put you in this program. Not everybody, because we have a bigger drug problem than 22 people, or yeah. whatever ends up in the program, and you have to... It's a certain criteria. I mean, if you're arm robbing people and you're doing all kinds of other bad things, you're going to jail. These are these are people that the court looks at and the common attorney looks at. And it looks like we think we can save you. We, would you you know you want to go in this program or you want to go to jail? Most people given the opportunity are going to say I want to go in a program. But this is structured, and if they mess up, they are going to jail. And that's the the good part about it, and why I think it's been so successful. Now, there was one more question over here. They're going to be, if we, oh, anyway. if our times doesn't go out, then... Uh, and, You'll think we're right out. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. 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 uh, we'd like numbers. to hear from all the people. Sorry, yes. yeah. Total number of staff uh, that machine has that... In Bowling Green, I don't really know the number. I've met the manager and a couple of the counselors, so it's not a lot, but it, it, it's probably more than I'm aware of. Thank you. One more. Thank you. I just want to know if there was a list of other localities that have... I don't know of any right on that. It's probably why we won the award. Thank you so much. My time is to call it for one of the finalists for the Best Achievement Award uh, winners for 2015. Uh, great questions. I'm sorry we have to. We want to make sure everyone has a chance to do their presentation and there's time at the end. We can certainly revisit those questions for any of the speakers that you wish to uh, I'll go back to. Now, up next is will be uh, uh, Supervisor uh, David Hutchins from Carroll County. Carroll County won the best award achievement for VACO for 2015. Their innovative program on the STEM process in agriculture. It's the only one of its kind in the nation. So all of you uh, will probably have an opportunity to have this program initiated in your community as well with uh, the other programs that are there. So please keep their names. If you need a benchmark, they'll be there to answer those questions for you. Without that saying, young man, my friend, Mr. David Hutchins. Thank you. And I cannot take credit for putting this, uh, this together. Our county administrator did, and he said, "You're gonna, you're gonna present it." <laughs> so it's, it's a, you see who runs the county. Uh, anyway, no. Uh, he has had a passion, as so have I, and most of our board members, for years to try to find ways for us to grow the future in our county. It's Carroll County is a very rural county. And we looked at a lot of ways going back, I guess, before 2008. But Carroll <coughs> County is a, a community rich in agricultural history. We, we kind of have a diverse operation. It's not huge. We aren't the largest county in, in any of these probably, but uh, our pumpkin production may rival any in the Commonwealth. But uh, <laughs> other than that, typically, these we, are, we have a lot of activity in each of them. The one that I would really like to just kind of touch on a second, the Southwest Virginia Farmers Market uh, was owned by the Commonwealth of Virginia. It was started years ago, five of them. Uh, four of them were closed or, or in the process of it. Carroll County had an opportunity to purchase or repurchase that land 
and those facilities back from the Commonwealth, which we now have, have moved into a regional uh, effort between the counties of Carroll, Grayson, and the city of Galax. It's operated under our under a regional uh, co-op plan, economic development plan. But that market puts millions of dollars of revenue back into the counties, not only Carroll, but Smith, all the counties surrounding, any of the farmers actually put, a lot of them go through produce, and, and our manager there, Kevin Simonis, deserves credit, along with the county administrator for that, but that's Kevin's, that's Kevin's passion, and he's done a great job with it. Carroll County, uh, we have a history, as I said. We were the first county with an agricultural program in a high school, going back to uh, 1917 Hughes Smith, a Smith Hughes Act. Woodlawn High School was developed, and you can kind of read the, the chart there, but it became a model of, uh, for other uh, ag classes and high schools across the, uh, well across the Commonwealth and then across the nation. So this isn't the first time we have set a trend, if you want to look at it, in terms of agriculture and what we have done with it. This, this gave rise to the teaching of agricultural sciences in the high school. There's, there's not many things that you cannot teach with agriculture, and this is what the STEM lab is doing. But it provided hands-on ex exercises to enhance other classroom education, uh, project work. It's modeled around the world, our, our agriculture classes were, and uh, it, was, it actually began to change and migrated into career and technical education. The Board of Supervisors has supported this going back to 2008. We did a, a part of our board goals was assisting in workforce development. We started looking at ways, and you guys have all talked about, and each of us have different workforce development issues, uh, drugs and a lot of other things, but we looked at ways that we could, as a board, could support and improve our workforce training. 2010, the board redefined those goals to uh, include a STEM lab for agriculture. We had looked at maybe a STEM lab <coughs> regionally, and that just didn't seem to work out. So we backed up and started looking at it from uh, for our school. Uh, there's a story that goes there, and I'll, if I have time, I'll share it with you. But uh, it was not necessarily a really easy process. But we started looking at it. We directed our IDA to go out and seek funding uh, for it. We had to have some upgrades, and now I'll get back up just a little. Our HVAC system was, was in really, really bad shape, and so I was reluctant to just borrow the money at the time, but I was an avid, and I think Gary would agree, I was an avid supporter of the STEM lab. So he kind of sucked me in and said, well, you know, if you, uh, if you vote for HVAC, maybe we can do the STEM lab. That's what we did. We, that's a good county ministry. No, anyway, Gary, I say that in all honesty. It was a team approach. But, uh, yeah, it, was a, it wasn't bait and switch. It was a bait and get the bait going, and we started growing. Dr. Littrell was on the board at the same time, and we started looking at those opportunities. They were successful at finding the money through rural development, and we were able to borrow about a little over half a million dollars. Uh, that was the beginning of our STEM lab in our high school in Carroll County. Renovations began, and I somehow had it in my mind before January, but I'm sure it was, and I think the planning started before January, the actual execution began. Our goal was to have it functional in the beginning of the following school year, at, at that fall. Uh, and there's some little shots here. It was a massive undertaking. I would say the contractors did a great job in moving it forward at a, at a very high rate of speed. They did that in conjunction with replacing all the HVAC, the water lines, and several other things in that high school that was, that was really in, in bad shape. They, they worked steady. They convert, we converted a former uh, lumber storage area. We added some space, and the thing I think that makes this really uh, important to us is it is attached, if you will, or tied directly 
to the other agricultural classrooms within the, the first floor, on the first floor. That makes it easy for those students to have access to it. It was completed. This the third, the middle bullet, or the second bullet, is the one that I find really interesting. I probably was one of those students that almost fell through the cracks. Uh, I was bored and I didn't pay much attention. But these students, and we have we have lots of testimonials from students who probably was not your academic student, they were maybe lesser. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to go to college in some cases, uh, but they have migrated to this STEM lab. There was a, a little story about a young kid who gave a presentation and he was probably not the best dressed. And when you looked at him, you would have probably said, yeah, that guy's trouble. He's, he's a drug, he, he's got problems. When he finished, and there were some very important folks there, when he finished, it was like, oh my goodness, that kid is doing that. It was because we found a way to interest him. We found a way to get an interest. And that's what causes, in my mind, kids to fall, as we call, through the cracks. We, there's no challenge. It's it's just not what they do. Uh, anything, just about, can be taught using agriculture through the STEM lab, and that's what that's what we're using there. As a result of that, we actually got national attention. Uh, this is just a couple of shots of, of what the lab looks like. Some of the things there, the Randy Webb, the uh, the teacher, uh, some of our IDA folks was visiting it. Uh, some FFA students was there along with uh, our local congressman as they did a tour. These students are, it's just amazing to see how dedicated and how anxious, it's bec it becomes a passion I guess is the best way to say it for them. Uh, a plaque that was presented to our IDA, Senator Kane was down and he, he went through the lab extensively. He met with uh, a lot of the students. He came away, and I, I believe it's safe to say, as he, he was talking with their superintendent of schools, he came away with a deep appreciation for what was happening there. It's something that just isn't happening anywhere else. Some more of the students with, with the senator. What's different from a science lab? And I'm sure there's things that I won't see that if later we can talk about. But it provides students the ability to solve problems, real life problems where, in my day, I'm not sure which one of those I would have been. I would have been a baby boomer, I suppose. You know, we did lab and we did chemistry and we did this and we dissected and we, we looked at things and we looked at flowers and, and corn and what have you. But we, we looked at it to learn these different pieces and parts and what they did. What the part was, how the, the nomenclature and those things. These kids look at things and they find ways to actually create. You get a deformed ear of corn, what caused it to be that way, for example, or any of those types of situations, they're able to take the DNA, the actual uh, makeup of the plant and they tie it back into what they can do and it teaches transferable skills and in my mind it's transformational almost. It increases the excitement of education. The first class I'm not sure that we had as many students interested. I think Gary can say now I think that there's the class is full. So full that the superintendent had said they were not going to have tours except on certain times that there was no scheduling. Before, anyone who wanted to go see the STEM lab, come on, I mean, anybody from state or local. Today, you, you need to schedule it. I'm sure there's some folks in Portland that could go. But, and that's how important and how excited it has been. Virginia Tech is providing graduate students to assist in the teaching. I think that's something that speaks volumes for them to become 
involved with the high school. They're providing campus activities for all the STEM students. They're providing master's level education that's taking place in high school. And in our day, this would probably be graduate study, easily. Today, they're learning and they're, it's just something that they're doing. Uh, this, I think you will find interesting. A transformation lab, students work to finish three days of gene splicing. How many high school students across the Commonwealth or across the nation is doing gene splicing? How many of us even think about it? I say that because that's what these kids are talking about. So I don't know what you call them, Gage. I, I'm not sure where they are, <laughs> but they may be above the lazy. I don't know. It's they engineered a bacteria that was resistant to antibiotics. Now, you, you, you ask that question, what are they going to do with that? Well, you look at that bacteria, you need an antibiotic now that will combat that. Now, can they develop that? I don't know. I'm not going to stand here and say, yeah, they've done that. If they did, they'd be a patent somewhere, <laughs> sure. And some drug company would have it. My point being that these are high school students. How many of us that went to college had an opportunity to do these kind of things? It's, it's, oh, uh, in, a recent, in a recent visit to the Tech students through the lab, uh, we did some things, they swabbed some stainless steel and local food processing and identified specific bacteria. These are all things that, that either uh, bachelor's degree or master's degree students would be working in. How can we affect the actions? Uh, this is a part that it wasn't necessarily voluntarily done by the school board. These are some things that you can do to, to have an adverse action on education, not provide funding, etc., etc. What we did, we chose to have a positive effect. We found ways to improve and provide this, the STEM lab that is actually ruin the educational opportunities for the students. This is what we did. We support education in general. Since William told me I didn't have much time. Focus funding, we have found ways to target the things and when we fund them, it's for, we fund our general education, but these are issues that we fund as a, as a target and if you choose to not do that, you choose to not take the dollars. I mean, that's maybe a kind of horse trading way of doing it. But uh, what it's done is it's assisted in setting educational priorities. Um, it's become a lot better relationship between our schools, our education, and the students are anxious to go. Those that are in the lab are anxious. I'm sure you're telling me to go, so I want you to look at this little guy right here. <laughs> and he is going to be the future STEM lab student. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I'll, I'll okay, no further questions here. <laughs> well, that should be, hopefully, if there's enough time to then we can ask up with follow up questions in that time. Thank you for winning the best achievement award of 2015. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so it. very much. Um, of course, you know, anytime you're facilitating, the facilitator is the bad guy, right? So <laughs> thank you that, uh, for that. Uh, our next up is Mr. Joel Friedman. He's the self-directed service program manager for Fairfax County. Now, these were the first three with the finalists in the best in show. Don't think ever that Fairfax is not in there as far as awards are concerned. They've won 15 awards up to this time with five of them, including five in this session. So they are very much active in the program. So again, ladies and gentlemen of the different counties, these are, these are places to uh, really look at and follow through with. He will speak on um, self-directed services, Fairfax Fall Church, Community Service Board. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Bill had mentioned earlier trying to get ideas. This may seem very focused people with intellectual disabilities, basic support and employment services, limited resources. But if you take the specifics out of that, I think you'll get a feel for what we, can, we did and what you can do by just substituting in different populations 
and different service activities. We are presented with a challenge, and this goes back in, oh, that breeze was good. It goes back to uh, 2003. Historically, Fairfax County has had a lot of students coming out of the school system with intellectual disabilities who, for them, the next step is um, day support for employment services. And employment services generally group supported employment or individual supported employment. Day support services traditionally are for people who aren't able to work to earn a wage but are involved in activity that might be work preparation, skill development. But we've had a lot of students coming out of the system and a lot of people moving into Fairfax County for the types of services that are provided in uh, uh, special education and in intellectual disabilities. So our challenge was limited public resources provide day support employment services basically for everyone who wants. Um, and that is basically the two populations, public school, special education <coughs> graduates, and community members in general. We're, we're seeing more families seeking individualized services, more special education students were graduating from the system, uh, fewer and less varied community-based employment opportunities. The, com the community has been a wreck. We've seen people who are working full-time go to part-time. We've seen people who have had uh, sites in forever in certain places those sites are no longer available competition with the non-disabled population put more people on waiting list replacement with day support employment service providers not to mention the aging of our service population medical advances have helped people live much longer than they used to live even 20 to 30 years ago and there's <coughs> limited resources right there it says day support and employment services but there's limited resources for everything these days. So the solution was basically to develop a new person-centered service option that gives individuals with intellectual disabilities and their families um, ability to select services best suited for their family members within an individualized capped budget. There was collaboration from top to bottom. The Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and their foresight realized that there was only so much they could continue to do, dollars upon dollars upon dollars upon dollars. Very restrictive in what the future uh, held. The Community Services Board always looking for new and innovative ways to do things. The County Executive and County Attorney, what we ultimately are, are doing is entering into service agreements with families to provide funding for them to purchase services directly. From the County Executive and County Attorney standpoint, it's like, what? So usually their familiarity is, we're going to contract with contractors. Contract with families, that sounds good. However, we're not, we haven't always done that. Very rarely have they done it. So we needed to involve the county executive and the county attorney, Fairfax County Departments, Management and Budget, which said, great, possibility to cap budgets. We can work with that. Purchasing and supply management, OK, we're going to contract with who? and Administration for Human Services, which allowed us to actually develop the contracts and the service agreements. The Arc of Northern Virginia was very instrumental in working with us. Person-centered planning, individual budgets, microboards, all things that are best practices in the field, they were helpful in focusing us to be able to address this and, and implement those. Uh, other service providers and public participation through focus groups and presentations. So this wasn't just a person sitting down and doing it. There was a top to bottom collaboration uh, from everybody. Um, so our service philosophy as we develop, and to say self-directed services is a work in progress. We are, are very static. We are not the same program we were last year as we are this year. We are certainly not the same program we were when we started back in July of 2007. And we want to change because it helps to address the changing needs of families and their family members. So our service philosophy is to enhance individualized service plans to better meet service recipients' needs and preferences. And on the surface, you might say, well, shouldn't everything do that? But there's a difference between the ideal, let's do that, and the reality of a service provider being able to do that in their times of limited funding and perhaps a more narrow focus in the services that they're able to provide. Build upon a service recipient's natural supports and community and reorient service use and expenditures toward services each family and service recipient prioritizes and finds meaningful. 
Why self-directed services? Families are taking a look at their family members. They always have and they always will. And they are advocates on behalf of their family members. So people are looking for things that perhaps are part-time. Their family members are no longer able to work five days a week, six hours a day. Um, services are provided one-to-one. -one. People who need that support but is generally not able to be funded in our system basically because it's so expensive, we remove people from that system. They're able to provide services one-on-one. -on -one. And people who have issues, behavioral issues, et cetera, we don't see those when there's one-to-one -one outside the stimulating environment. Other activities not available elsewhere. These are very uh, focused, created for the individual services, are closer to home. A lot of times, people sit on a bus for 45 minutes each way. And in Fairfax County, that could just be five miles. But in some instances, that 45 minutes could also be across county. And so people don't feel that they're in their home communities anymore. Um, and they're provided by people they know personally. A lot of times, families have a great reliance on the staff that service providers often, you know, allow to provide services. However, they don't know them personally all the time. And there's always that little bit of hesitancy that says, I'm not quite sure about this person. I'm sure they're doing great. However, I wish I knew them better. So all of these things come into play. Uh, just a little bit overview, Fairfax County CSB pri uh, prioritizes contracting out to not-for-profit service providers. There's about 20 different services providers that are there. About 18 of them are contracted not-for-profits or other, other businesses. The CSB offers two programs. One is self-directed services and the other is our cooperative employment program, which is for people who are um, able to work more independently in the community. Um, so all of these things, people get to help a little bit more families in determining you know, what's going to happen with their family members. We contract directly with family and provide funds for them to purchase direct training, support, and supervision um, for services of their choice for their family member. And the family member, to the best of their ability, participates in this process. It's not families arbitrarily saying, you will go out and do this. Families know their family members. They know what they like, they know what's beneficial, they know what's meaningful. And so that everybody's involved in that process. Um, we start with 80% of funding um, of the annual cost of services if the services were provided by a CSB contractor. Families have less overhead. There's less licensure, there's less insurance, there's less phone, copying, office supplies, everything else that goes with it. So we can bring the cost down a little bit for that. What our families are saying, this isn't necessarily a picture of the family who said that, but self-directed services gives us the ability to design a program appropriate for a family member while it's a lot of extra work because families do absorb some responsibilities. Um, they have to identify the, the service provider, they have to hire that person, train that person, supervise that person, uh, compensate that person, and document that person, or find an agency who provides services. We also appreciate the ability to pick our own caregivers and have some flexibility in what they pay them. Our hourly rate, um, if you're using self-directed services funds, is $20 an hour. We try to tie that to Medicaid waiver. However, um, if you can find someone who can work for $15 and the family is comfortable with that person, that stretches their dollars out. To give you a little bit of perspective, $20 an hour over a standard contract probably gives you about um, 15 to 18 hours a week. For some families and some family members, that's perfect. Uh, again, not everybody can work five days a week, six hours a day. Um, partners are for successful service, the service recipients and their families, um, CSB support coordinators and inter interdisciplinary teams, our program staff, and other self-directed services participant families. We used to say that um, self-directed service is like a three-legged stool. You know, the families, the support coordinators, and services staff support the person. Can't do that with Anyway, support the person um, who is the stool. But we have found that other self-directed services participant families have turned that into a four-legged stool. And they're very open to participation, even to the point where we have a family support group that's been started there. What families say, I guess I want to go back. This is um, Elena. Um, ad adapted aquatics, you know, enjoying what you wouldn't necessarily get through a more traditional service provider, only because they don't have the resources or the facility to do that. 
Um, Self-directed services has allowed the flexibility and opportunity for our daughter to fully participate in activities in the community that are more meaningful and most importantly, her choice. We thank you for this choice. And this is Sarah, who with her companion is working, the, the companion is working at an information tent at the Fairfax City Volunteer, uh, Fourth of July Parade, something she might not have been able to do otherwise. Self-directed services brings greater service management to the family and the, and the participant, uh, increased and expanded service options and plans, greater flexibility in scheduling and receiving services. It doesn't have to be during the day, during the week, and a lot of things are in the evening or on weekends. And service choices are in the service recipient's home community. We work to shape the whole to fit the peg. Yeah. What families say, the range of resources available because self-directed service allows to tailor a program for a disabled child is better than anything can advantage without the service. This is Ryan uh, volunteering to distribute pamphlets at the American, uh, at the Smithsonian's Museum of American History, I'm sorry, Natural History. We work on skill development, community integration, safety awareness, travel, social interactions. Activities can be educational, recreational work, or volunteer. For the service provider, we also are able to provide mileage activity, missions, fields, and transportation. Um, we don't want people to not have opportunities because families can't afford to pay for a meal if going out to lunch in the community is something that that person wants to do, likes to do, and is beneficial for that person to do. Um, transportation to and from activities. You can see how our participation has grown. We were kind of, uh, you know, first three years, people weren't really knowing about us, but we have really taken off in the last four years, and it's been word of mouth. Um, families have a great communication system. One family would say, hey, why aren't you in this program? So like, then I get a phone call. Cost avoidance has been an additional benefit for us. As you can see in FY14, $454,000 would have been the cost to send our people, our, our 58 or 30 people to traditional services. Self-directed services only cost 241,000. That cost avoidance is 212. So cumulatively, um, it's, all, it's just under 500,000. FY15, which we're cl still closing out now, is going to be a cost avoidance of between 300 and 350,000 as the program has grown. For the uh, future, we need to continue to increase the uh, awareness of self-directed services. Expand the capacity of existing service providers, identify new service providers, and consider individual budgets based on actual need and usage rather than projected level of service. Um, what families are saying, 100% agree or strongly agree that they're satisfied with self-directed services. 92% agree or strongly disagree that self-directed services are flexible enough to meet their changing needs. And 100% agree or strongly agree that their family is better off as a result of self-directed services. Um, this is... Um, Brian working with the local food bank to help get things ready. Um, you can read what the families say, but another great thing is that on some weekends, my son goes with his companion to do activities, allowing a very, very tired mom to do her own activities or just clean the house. Especially his daughter's on a list a mile long for traditional services. Self-directed services can be a bridge. People can come to us, they can go from us based on whatever their service needs are and the availability. We've got uh, Brandon uh, camp at the beach um, with people his, his own age. Um, Elena out ice, skate, ice skating, a community group with the family. Uh, Brandon at Cameron's Coffee and Chocolates, loving his paycheck that he has there. Um, Brian bowling, and as most of us do, come on, come on, come on, come on, got to get that ball in there and that strike. And Stephanie, who does therapeutic riding, representing her stable. Um, at the Special Olympics um, and winning you know, for that as well. And so that, in an essence, whew, is self-directed <laughs> services. <laughs> so catch my Any breath. questions? You have a question? As far as travel expenses are concerned, do you contract that out or is that something the county provides? Um, no, it is it's not necessarily contracted out. It would be the same transportation that would be available to anybody with a disability. So Metro Access would be there, the Metro system, taxi cabs that would be there. But it's not a contracted system like it might be so for you Medicaid don't, waiver. You, you don't have a system to go by and pick them up at their house. they got to get to a spot. 
we, they picked up. That is correct. The county does have a system, but these particular individuals are not u needing to use it because they can use their funds to access more traditional services, one-on-one -on -one transportation services. Again, thank you so much. You see the All right. Ooh, you I figure I got like two minutes. <laughs> First of all, this is our final speaker today is Chris, uh, Christopher McClurney, County Administrator of Giles County. This is Giles County's first award that they received. We want to congratulate them for putting in that effort and hopefully more and more that you will do in the, uh, in the ensuing years. So let's give them a hand for that. <laughs> Welcome, Chris McLean. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. As I mentioned, this is our first award. Uh, we do have three of our Board of Supervisors members here with us today, and I appreciate their support coming over. Uh, the other two were coming, but they wouldn't let them land the county jet because of the fog. So they <laughs> uh, I'll give you a few stats on Giles County. We're a rural community, 17,000 people. Uh, I'll skip through some of this. Try to save some time. Our real estate tax rate is about 61 cents. Uh, we have about a 50 million dollar budget annually. Uh, some key assets, and I'd ask, how many of you have actually been to Giles County before? Mm. Several. Yeah, that first slide was the Cascades. Oh, you been oh. there? I know I've been it. There. Did you, you know, know that was in Giles County? What? Did you know that was in Giles County? Or no, did you take a memory? I know it. It was just the Cascades. <laughs> right of passage for people at Virginia Tech. Yeah, about 150,000 people a year. Uh, visit the Cascades, but 37 miles of the New River, and you'll notice down the corner, uh, we're selling a new trademark there, near the water trail, uh, 37 miles of the New River in Giles County. Uh, truly a beautiful place. Uh, we're right next door to Virginia Tech, Bradford University, and New River Community College. So, uh, like everyone has talked about here today, we all have uh, problems, social issues that we all have to deal with. Uh, jail costs, court costs, social services, police, and EMS makes up about 61% of our budget. And if we look back since 2008, they, those costs have increased more than 33%. So we have a board of supervisors uh, that has a very strong work ethic themselves. Uh, they're all uh, in employment and they all work hard and they believe everyone else should. And uh, so they looked at us and said, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to slow this issue down? Uh, and what we figured out is there is no single magic bullet, but we believe it's a systemic problem and it's going to require systemic solutions. So. I also said, you know, in a place as small as Giles County with 17,000 people, you should be able to solve some of these problems. Uh, it's not like some of the issues with Fairfax. You have neighborhoods that have more people than, than we have in the entire county. We should be able to solve these problems. So uh, we looked uh, to see what really was our issues, and I'll get into it a little later. We've uh, we actually mapped our social issues. We geo-referenced uh, problems such as courts, uh, social services, police calls, fire calls, EMS calls. We mapped that in our GIS, and then I'll show it to you in just a moment. What we figured out is 1% or 91 addresses in the county are utilizing 25% of our services, reactive services as we call it. I see a lot of you shaking your head. It's, it's similar everywhere. 5% of the, the residences in the county uh, use 55% of the services. So a very small portion of the population is, is utilizing a, a lot of services, costs us a lot of money. Um, so our goal is one, drive down the cost of incarceration. That's a, that was a big expense for us. Lower recidivism rates, get people working. That includes youth, inmates, people who are on public assistance, TANF. Uh, many of you are familiar with TANF. And then improve the quality of life today and in the future through education. So here are some of the things, and I think what we uh, won the award for, a number of different programs that we've initiated recently. Day report program that you heard about earlier. Uh, we'll get into a lot of that, but it's. Our recidivism rates, and this is a local rate, state rate's much higher, but local recidiv recidivism rates for Giles uh, were 26%. All those that have gone through our day report program over a six-year period uh, is 18%. We're very happy with that. Our average annual direct savings is just over $200,000 a year. Our TANF work program, 44% uh, of the people who have gone through the program, and that's 44% of the total number of people on TANF in Giles County are now off of it. Uh, and, and depends on what you call success, but many of them are back to work. As you can see, 14 of those employed, 14 sanctioned. Uh, and basically what happens is you have to work. If you're going to receive these benefits, you work for the county. And uh, if you don't want to do that, if you don't show up, 
then you're sanctioned and you don't get the benefit. So it's one way or the other. And most people figure out it makes a lot more sense to just go ahead and find a job somewhere as opposed to just trying to receive benefits. Uh, we have an inmate work program. We're getting about 15,000 hours annually. Uh, again, you'll see work show up in a lot of these. Our board believes you should work and that people should work. And that that's how you uh, develop self-respect. And uh, so you're going to see a lot of talk about work for us. Uh, community services work program. Between this and the day reporting program, we've given judges uh, some alternative sentencing uh, opportunities. And they like it. They like not having to send everyone to jail. That's not the solution, as you've heard here today already. Uh, and this community services work program, 12,000 hours annually that we're getting out of folks, that's a rural community. Uh, that's a lot of hours. And we're using those people everywhere. We've got them working on a golf course. Uh, we've got them working on a golf course. They may be on a garbage truck. Just wherever they're needed, uh, we use them. And uh, it's worked out very well for us. Uh, summer youth work program, uh, 35 students annually. The county pays for half of the, their salary, and the business that they work in pays the other half. Uh, it's worked extremely well for us, uh, and we anticipate this next year we'll ask the board to allow us to go to 50 students. But we are in the schools talking uh, with administrators, finding out which kids do we need to target. Which kids are in multi-generational families who are uh, dependent on public assistance? And we go to those kids and say, here's an opportunity for you to work. And you know, one-on-one -on -one interaction with them uh, has worked very well and uh, can't say enough about all the, the positive things that businesses have said back to us about this program. And then we've been trying to enhance pre-K education opportunities. Uh, received a grant of about three and a half million dollars uh, last year. And so there are more slots for pre-K education in Giles now than we actually have kids, which is a wonderful problem. We used to have a waiting list of 50 to 75, uh, and that is not, not the case anymore. The Board of Supervisors has also uh, invested heavily. We, we spend twice as much on pre-K education as we did uh, just five years ago. And then the last program, uh, we call it ACE, uh, Access to Community College Education. Uh, in Giles County, if you graduate and maintain a 2.5 grade point average throughout high school, you can go to New River Community College, which is one of the best technical schools uh, in the East, if not in the country, and uh, you can go there for two years at no cost. All you pay for is your books. The county picks up a tab for all of that. Uh, and when I say the county, we do it with tax dollars. We also have uh, relationships with businesses in the county. Uh, the Board of Supervisors puts up half the money, and we raise the other half. So, uh, great program, and uh, yeah, it's, it's outstanding so far. A lot of, uh, a lot of people are very happy about that. This last thing uh, I mentioned it earlier in the presentation, utilizing GIS, we've mapped 22 different services uh, by address, not by people, but by address. And I think you'll find this pretty interesting. Then we've brought together 33 service agencies. And if you're like me, most of several county administrators here today, you know, you have all these service agencies that we give money to every year, but it's really hard to get your arms around what they actually provide and to understand what they're doing in the community. Uh, accountability. Uh, is really not there. And uh, you know, a lot of you shaking your head. It's hard to make sure that those people are, that what they're doing is working and that your money is being spent well. We brought all these people around the table and we've taken, uh, and this is the calls that we mapped, uh, and you can see there, and it's you know, the stuff that you would typically find where you've got problems in homes, family issues, uh, drug abuse, all those types of problems. We've taken that and mapped it. And what you see here is a column instead of a house, which would normally show up on a 911 uh, map, there's a column there. And it's probably hard for you to tell, but you'll see different colors. And those colors in these columns uh, designate different issues. If you've been, uh, if EMS has been called uh, to your residence numerous times, you may have a, a tall red column. When you see some of these columns over your houses, yeah, you get over to some of these areas. Right here? Yeah, you need to know where that's at. Yeah, we're, you're completely out of map on that one, that's right. What starts to stand out to you, and, and we tried to find a model of this and, and haven't been able to, that's a yeah, I and mean, we'd love to follow someone else's example, but what we found out has been somewhat surprising, uh, some of the areas where we didn't realize where some of those issues were. And here's just a, a blown up section. This is a uh, subsidized housing uh, unit with nearly, I mean, two-year-old, three-year-old houses that are beautiful and really nice neighborhood. But it doesn't seem to matter. The quality of the home, that location, when you see what's happened here in this area, a lot of calls. Uh, this is a big neighborhood. There's, you know, 500 houses there. You don't really have a lot of issues, but you do in this area. So what that allows us to do is take these 33 service agencies <coughs> and focus their efforts 
And the first chunk that we're biting out of this, and how you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Well, we're taking this first 91 uh, addresses, and we have a gentleman that we call the quarterback because he's going to direct these services. One of the issues you'll run into is confidentiality issues when you're dealing with these 33 service agencies. They can't communicate with one another, which is part of the problem, quite frankly. But they can communicate with those who provide funding to them. That's the county. So they can talk to us. If there's someone who has the time and that's their job and that's what they're assigned to do, they can bring these agencies together and can talk to another agency and say, you know, you can provide this service in this house. The quarterback, part of his job is to literally visit all 91 of these houses. He, I want him to know the family, uh, everyone that lives there, the kids that live there. You know, what problems, what issues do they have? And once they have all this information, his job is to try to get to these kids, to try to break this cycle of trouble, drug abuse, all these problems, using the proactive services that we all already have. So the idea is not to spend more money or create uh, additional uh, really red tape or additional bureaucracy, because we try to stay away from bureaucracy as much as possible. It's just to try to make the services we have more effective. So uh, with that, see you got one more picture there, Joe. Uh, if you haven't been there, Giles County is a beautiful place. Come spend some money. <laughs> uh, part of my job also is tourism, and uh, Jenny McCoy is with us, and I uh, certainly appreciate her efforts putting all this stuff together. Uh, but Giles is a beautiful place. Uh, you know, it's, it's not real complicated. I think it's common sense what we're trying to do, but uh, it seems to be somewhat unique and someone's up. We should get an award for it. We do appreciate that. So, I got yes, one sir. question for you. Yes, sir. It doesn't really pertain to what you've been talking about specifically, but is Mountain Lake in Giles County? Yes, sir, it is. And uh, following that up, how is it doing? Well, as I'm actually the chairman. Is it a lake? Is it a lake? Yeah. I can tell you a little bit about it. I'm the chairman of yeah. the board at Mountain Lake. Okay. It is now operated is by a, uh, a 501c3 corporation that's local. Uh, as a hotel, it's doing well, better than it's ever done. We've had our best months this past summer. Uh, the lake itself, not doing well at all. Uh, it did come back up some. Uh, there's some holes in the dam on the north end, and we did repair some, but what we found is there's just probably too many to repair. And so, as nature takes its course, it will gradually fill in uh, with sediment, and it'll fix itself. Right now, there's in the north end, there's probably 40-foot uh, water, where there normally is 100. At full pond. Mm -hmm. Are you open a uh, uh, year round now? Yes, sir, we are. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're actually closed in February. After Valentine's Day, uh, February to about the middle of March, the weather there gets so bad, it's yeah. hard to keep the roads open. But, yeah. Could you put that slide up with the, with the, the one before that? I want to take a photo of that. Sure, yes, <laughs> <laughs> This might be a very good thing for different cats. Now, your quarterback, what is his specific? I mean, what, that's, what, it. Huh? that's it. I mean, he works for who? He works for me. Oh, so this is, he's not in the, the sheriff's department no, or anything like that, no. social services? No, ma'am. No, in fact, we don't want him to be in any of those departments because we want him to hold those departments accountable. Because right now, that's a very difficult thing to do. When it comes to these social issues, you know, Board of Supervisors meet once a year with those uh, various agencies, and they decide if they're going to give them their budget or not. Uh, this helps us to understand, one, what they're doing, not just in these particular, like for us, these 91 residences that we're attacking, 1%, uh, but it also helps us to understand overall what they're doing in the county, what's working, what's not, uh, allows you to get to know things. I, I'm ashamed to admit, you know, I'm county administrator, it's my job. As I sat around the table when we first started our meetings with all these organizations, I didn't know what a lot of them did. Some of the services they provided just had never heard of. So, uh, you know, it's a learning experience for all of us. Now, do you fund most of those organizations? We do. Yes, ma'am. In one oh, form or another, not completely. Well, yeah. Some of them are state. The health department is at the table. There's health department data built into this. Uh, there's EMS, and there's fire. I saw the slide uh, prior to that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, these are the things that are built in. There's 22 or 23 uh, different data. So those are the people that help you gather the sure. material to do that chart? Well, we gather the data from these organizations, from yes, and because, again, confidentiality issues, HIPAA laws, we right. have to be really careful. We've had our attorney involved, uh, attorney involved in this uh, every step of the way. Uh, some are very reluctant to provide data. There's information we wanted to have that we don't, quite frankly. But uh, this gives you a pretty clear picture. 
of what's going on and where. It uh, allows you to go door to door, and that's in a community as small as Giles, you can do that. And uh, we're just getting started with this aspect of what we're doing. So I'll tell you in a year how it's working out. Can I ask one more? Yes, I know that in Southwest Virginia, uh, it's pretty inexpensive if you can find a place to get away with making methamphetamine. Yes, sir. You have a problem over in Giles County, as many other counties in uh, Southwest Virginia. We do have a few meth labs that show up every once in a while, but I, that's not the, the biggest problem we have. Prescription meds are the biggest issue that we have in Giles. There's, which, uh, which, is there the is next, some, which is the next meeting in this room. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. We yes. were real fortunate. He mentioned our quarterback. We were fortunate. We feel real fortunate. We had a gentleman that just retired from the, from the game board, state park, state in a fisher, he just retired. And trust me, he knows his way around. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Congratulations on your award. Look, uh, don't blame my head, my heart is in it. Um, uh, I ran a little over on time, Chris. But a county is for its citizens, it's what you do for those who really can't do for themselves. So all of you, I applaud you for all your efforts and congratulations. Thank you.